Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for our first annual New Employee Equity Academy. We're really excited to have you all here. Uh, and just as a note, this, this meeting is being recorded for people who weren't able to attend today. So, uh, you know, feel free to turn your video off. You, it won't be recorded during the breakout sessions. We'd love to see your faces. So, you know, keep them on if you'd like. Uh, but uh, during the breakout sessions, those, those portions won't be recorded. Those will be private. Uh, we're very happy to have you here today and we're gonna look at the agenda in a few minutes. Uh, and later on, we're gonna hear from our Director of Student Equity and Success about um, what closing our equity gaps, which is the whole purpose of what we're doing today. And he will get into some detail about activities that we're doing with this. But first we wanted to talk about our why we are doing this and we're gonna start with some words from leadership across the state. Oops, shoot, went back one too many. Uh, so a few weeks ago after the George Floyd killing, the state chancellor's office, the California Community College's state chancellor's office uh, did a call to action webinar and uh, many of us here attended that webinar and it was it had a, a huge impact on us uh, but one of the things that uh, we found really powerful was one it was all very powerful but it, but a quote, quote from the state chancellor eli oakley we need to figure out how we use our positions of privilege influence to make a difference in this moment we cannot say we are equity champions and be afraid to have an open dialogue about structural racism. We cannot talk about equity without talking about inequality. And we cannot talk about inclusion without talking about oppression. So we've been doing work on this campus for, for years now. Uh, but more recently in the last year, we've been really on race um, and particularly are African American males who are the most disproportionately impacted on campus. So we feel very strongly about the most current work that's being done across the state. Um, which you will hear more about from Ray, uh, is a group out of, help me, USC? Cora is USC, Donna's nodding, yes. <laughs> uh, and they put on a webinar uh, a couple of weeks ago that was, shoot, sorry, back. Particularly Cora, Cora is San Diego State. San Diego State, thank you, Marianne. Uh, um, Q, Q is USC. Thank you. <laughs> um, this was particularly on anti-blackness, anti-racism as it is in regards to blackness in response to the George Floyd killing. So we just wanna play a clip from you. Regina Stanback Stroud uh, is, she is the current um, chancellor at Peralta District. She was previously the president of Skyline College. And many of us went on a visit to Skyline College a couple years ago, year and a half ago. Uh, and we got to work with her and we've worked with her since. She's a very good friend of Fresno City College. And we wanted to share a little piece of what she said in the webinar. So it's a little clunky in the context, but the message is important to me, maybe. So I'm gonna share that. This work on anti-blackness. The, um, what I would like to give you an example of is when I decided to uh, apply to be the president of a college, I recognized that I was going into, I'm, I'm in, a, in a county that's not, that was not necessarily known for its diversity. I was in San Mateo County. And I went into the uh, process presenting who I am as a leader. So the first thing I did, uh, I want you to know, is that I said to the Board of Trustees, as they uh, interviewed me, I said to them, you need to understand my perspective and you need to understand my leadership framework. Um, and this is me interviewing, trying to get the job. <laughs> and I said, so if these words scare you, then I'm not your best candidate. And the words were white male supremacy is a universal concept. It is not unique to the United States. It is a pillar upon which this nation was founded. The government was established and the constitution was created. 
white male supremacy influences formal and informal relationships between and among people in public and private spheres of life. Social and political constructions of oppression and discrimination against women and people of color, in particular, people of African descent remain embedded in American political, economic, religious, and educational institutions, as our colleague, Sister uh, Bell Hook said. Okay, so I'm going to stop it there. We are going to, you'll be able, you'll receive copies of this later, and you can watch the full videos of both of these, and I really encourage you to do that on your own time, because they're very, very good. So, we go over the agenda today uh, and I didn't tell you who I am so my name is Carrie Ibarra I am the guided pathways coordinator here at Fresno State College and I also teach philosophy uh, so here's the agenda for this morning you're going to be with us until about 12 uh, for the first almost two hours we're gonna you're gonna meet your support team and we're gonna do an artifact sharing activity that hopefully you all prepared for uh, and then we're gonna do some uh, what you're going to meet our Senate leaders, our academic uh, student and classified Senate leaders are here with us today and they're going to say hi to you. And then we're going to have an equity conversation, do a little break around 1050 to 11. And then from 11 to 12, you'll be in your cohorts with your uh, group, your support guides, your faculty support guides. So your support team. I'm not going to go through all the names. I will leave it up here, but I'm just going to say that every person who has participated in this, um, this is really has been a team effort pulling this together to do this work today. And originally we had, we've been planning this for some time. Uh, so originally we were hoping to meet you all in person and uh, we had to do a little shift. But um, all of these people on the team have been heavily involved in equity work for the last couple of years and and every single person is a uh, leader in equity for the campus and then we just wanted to acknowledge all of you so we're not going to go through introductions in this section because there's there's a lot of people here but when we do the breakout rooms then we'll get to know each other a little better and and, and hopefully we are all your team for, for the time you are here at Fresno City College or for the time we're here. I'm assuming some of you will outlast us. And um, so we want to let you know that um, it's not just about today, that, that you can come to any of us if you need support. Uh, and if we don't have answers, we will go find people who have the answers for you. And not all of you could be here today. So um, uh, those, as I mentioned, those who aren't here will get a recording of the video. I think we counted, there's about 30 new people total, a little over 30. And I think we have about 19 of you here today. All right, so we are gonna start off with a warm up activity. It's an artifact sharing activity, and we're gonna go into breakout rooms. So in a moment, you are going to get a little button pop up that's gonna say enter breakout session and, and you'll do that. And, and then at the end, make sure that you, when you leave that breakout session, that you don't leave the meeting. So just leave the breakout and it will bring you back to this meeting. So this, we've gotten about 45 minutes for this uh, project and um, it's two minutes each, but because of the number of people, we might have a little more time to have some conversation and get to know each other. So any questions before we start the breakout or any of my support team, is there anything I missed? No, Carrie, it's Susie. I am uploading the artifact sharing warm-up activity sheet in okay. the chat for the uh, breakout room facilitators. Perfect, thank you. Um, I would add that if you do have a question when we're in the main room um, in particular, but uh, probably in the breakout rooms as well, you can use the chat box. Um, I will try to monitor it and get your questions answered. Thank you. Yes, Shoshanik is going to let me know if there's, if, if there's anything I need to address. I'm not good at monitoring chat and leading a, a Zoom session at the same time. 
All right, so Susie, should we see, be seeing the breakout pop up? Sending you into the rooms. Hang on to your hats. Is Shoshana here or is she in a? She's in Michael's. Michael's, okay, so I will look at the chat. Looks like Jackie, Jackie's helping out with chat. And Keith. Finding things for, is it Dania? Yes. Yes, Dania. Who apparently lives in Visalia, from what I can tell from the last of the, ch the, the chat. <laughs> and is looking yeah. for food recommendations. So help her out, put something in the chat if you know places in Visalia. My mom lives in Visalia and she loves food. So I'll, I'll <laughs> now and see. Yeah, a lot of stuff's not open. Most places I think are doing takeout though, even with COVID. Well, we're waiting for Michael. Does anybody have anything else they wanna share from their breakout? Um, one of the things we talked about in ours was um, the value of using this kind of activity in the classroom if you're an instructor. Uh, and I am thinking about activities that I'm going to do. There's a lot of great stuff out there. This is just one. Um, both Sally and Jackie uh, are leading our um, online training this summer for people to learn how to teach online. Uh, they have some great ideas. I know there's uh, Julio, I've talked to him about icebreakers that he does. They call them icebreakers, these activities. Um, so, you know, feel free to share ideas with each other about icebreakers or ask anybody, you know, if they have ideas for you, any of us. Okay, it looks like everybody's back. So I do want to say before we move on, I should have especially thanked um, Susie who as not only was not only on the planning team, but she she provided all of the technical support for us today and set everything up and sent out all your invitations. And she's so on top of things. And I'm telling you, without a Susie, <laughs> this kind of thing can't happen. You know, somebody who's really there to help and, and iron out all these um, crazy details. And we did a practice run through last night. She sent us stuff. So, um, and I think I mentioned all of us are doing this for the first time. This kind of session on Zoom. We've, we've all hosted many um, activities before, but this is this is new to us. So thank you, Susie, for all your help. All right. Thank you, so Gary, I, it's quite literally my job. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness you're really, really amazing at it. And I was gonna throw a cuss word in there, but I won't because she is, I'm not kidding. <laughs> okay, so um, next I wanna introduce you to some of our, our Senate leaders or all of our Senate leaders actually. So. At Fresno City College, we have a um, classified Senate, we have a student Senate, and we have a faculty Senate. And so we have the leads here, and we're going to start with Duran is our Associated Student Government President. He's awesome. He's probably been the most visual, and especially with COVID even now, one of the most visual presidents, at least in my time here, um, of the, the student president. So we're very fortunate to have him for the time that we do. Duran, go ahead and uh, you want to say hello to our people here and tell you about yourself. So hello everybody. Uh, thank you for you know the staff and faculty for inviting me to this discussion and uh, thank you all for showing up all the new faculty and staff. Uh, welcome. Glad to have you guys and uh, I, I did you know introduce myself in our breakout session but I'll go ahead and do it again. Of course I'm Deron Walker. I am the former Associated Student Government President for the fiscal year of 2019-2020 and social advocate at heart. So the work always continues. And I am actually, you know, looking forward to hopefully getting involved in ASG. Not, not sure how that's looking like for this next semester coming up because of the whole COVID situation, but, uh, you know, still excited to, you know, try out these new uh, remote remedies, I call them. You know, uh, I feel like this is something that we should have taken care of a long time ago with uh, establishing 100% online classes because I feel like that could help a lot with our equity and, you know, establishing a, you know, availability of classes to all, not just, you know, the people that can make the time for it, you know, because a lot of us have busy lives like myself. Uh, I, I, I thought it was wonderful to hear that we're going 100% online, to be quite honest, and not, you know, 
too savvy on how much it takes for stu you know, students and teachers to make that transition, but I'm so glad that we're actually making that now. But uh, as far as what I wanted to, you know, just have my take on today was just to address student equity here at Fresno City College and uh, just promote it and encourage it. Um, there are already like several different uh, resources available to students to address equity and help out the impoverished community that we have on campus. And the, the, the sad part about it is that not enough people actually know about it. And that's staff, faculty and students just are not aware of the wonderful programs and resources we have available to them. So I would say to address equity on campus is really just becoming aware, you know, familiarize yourself with all the uh, different resources we have on campus because I mean, it may not uh, fit every demographic for every single student, but there are many demographics that fit and meet, you know, all ba backgrounds of life. So just to become familiar, like for instance, our scholarships even, you know, a lot of students don't realize that there's scholarships that are just sitting there waiting for them and it meets, you know, certain criteria that they may have. And just informing students about that, how you could better inform and familiarize yourself with I would suggest the same way that I did. When I when I came to Fresno City, honestly, I didn't know anything about the campus. I didn't really even stay on campus for very long. I just, I went to class, I went back home, and I just, you know, I was like, you know, just study, do, do my homework. I never thought of like campus life being a part of me. But then I started at Student Activities working there, and it just, it like, it opened a whole new world to me. So I, I would really highly recommend just go and reaching out to student activities because they're very active on campus and involvement with all the students, um, considering that they are actually what facilitates the different clubs on campus, the ASG, all student activities is what they're, you know, called, they are, you know, having a hand in and that will, you know, just, you know, get you more familiarized with what student activities are going on on campus and also even what uh, the, the staff and faculty are putting on and you know, seeing how you might be able to get yourself involved in that. And um, I, I would say what my biggest um, concern was when I was with ASG was the fact that not enough students are getting involved. And, you know, that also could address equity on campus to so just allowing more student uh, advocates to be, you know, mentors for others, each other. And the fact that we don't have so much involvement in ASG, I feel, I mean, we, we do have a lot of club activity, but I mean, I, I feel there should still be a consistency of the uh, student leadership because we as students, I mean, we do look up to you staff and faculty, of course, but you know, we as students, I mean, we, we you know, we, we feel more comfortable with each other. So it's, I would say it would be best for us to mentor each other, but we also need you guys to help facilitate that for us. And um, I, I would just recommend, you know, starting a club, you know, students are, solely responsible for starting and, you know, continuing different events that might be a tradition, but, you know, staff and faculty, you guys are more than welcome. You're going to be there longer than all the students are there. You know, their time is just, you know, temporary and, you know, you being able to be there, you know, hopefully more permanent, that would establish more of a lifeline for all the other students that are coming in and just, you know, create new traditions and um, just, you know, trying to, you know, make yourself involved is is the key and the way to do that like i said just talk to student activities see if you can get involved in different clubs on campus and it doesn't have to be what students have already somebody just you're good sorry you're sorry you're I, I i'm actually getting um i was in another meeting that just started at 10 <laughs> and they can't hear me but i'm not even talking to them sorry um i'm, I'm actually a calpers outreach uh specialist here on campus so I was uh, attending some meeting that just started at 10. So I apologize for the interruption, but uh, yeah, I'll just go ahead and continue. So um, yeah, uh, my, my whole big thing is just, of course, equity, you know, that's, that's you know, all, all the, you know, social stuff that's going on right now in regards to the Black Lives Matter, you know, like I feel like now is the, you know, mo most important time than ever to start really getting ourselves involved and addressing, you know, the, the inequity amongst our, our culture, like it's just embedded in us and we need to remove that. And the only way I can see fit of us doing it is doing it together. And of course, we need mentors. Like, I, I, I can't imagine myself being involved in, in the campus as much as I am today without the, the wonderful mentors I had, I would say at student activities, you know, cause they, you know, they already had everything there that was, you know, 
can, you know, cater towards students, but they also were my mentors and they, you know, and, and what truly compelled me to get involved in campus was them, you know, telling me that they seen what, you know, the greatness I had in me and just made me believe in myself more. And I, I feel like everyone needs that. You guys could be a perfect advocates for, for our students and, you know, just, just help them want to remain going to college and seeing that they do have a place there a lot of students I, I've seen and I've heard from firsthand that they don't feel like they belong and we just want to make them feel welcome just as you know FCC is trying to welcome you here today but uh I believe I've taken up a, a bunch of your guys' time so far and I do have a meeting at 10 that I need to attend uh with CalFresh Outreach but uh that, that's actually one thing you could tell students about too uh we are a CalFresh Outreach program here on Fresno City College and uh we try to help students apply for food stamps. So you can start now by helping the students uh, meet their, their food needs and just let them know that we do have a CalFresh outreach program here. You can uh, send them to me. I'll actually leave my uh, email in the chat. So you guys are welcome to reach out to me for any you know inquiries. And also if you know any students that need assistance applying for food stamps, I'm here for them. And know that uh, they're actually giving extra benefits for students during the, uh, or, or just anyone in general, extra food stamps due to the COVID pan pandemic. So maybe that you could just let them know so they'll be interested in applying sooner, because the sooner the better. Ron, and, thank you so much. I know you need to jump off to your other meeting, but I'll say all the wonderful things after you leave about you. Just know, you can go back and watch it later. <laughs> yeah, you guys are recording it. So yeah, thank you so yeah. much for having me. You thank all. you. And, um, yes, please do encourage more students to participate in things like this because I love it. I, I feel, you know, appreciated and I really, you know, I, I, I want to help. And I know there's a lot of more students out there just like me. You guys just need to reach out to them just as you reach out to me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And you guys have yourselves a wonderful rest of your day. You too, Jerron. Thank you. Thanks, Jerron. All right, thanks. So um, students are the reason we're here. <laughs> and so I'm so glad Deron was able to come spend some time with us today. And um, one of the things that struck me was um, it's all, everything he said, but um, towards the end, he said that, you know, students don't feel like they belong. And the fact that they're the reason we're here and they don't feel like they belong, you know, that we really wanna try to bring them into every space that we have. It's hard, I've, I serve on a lot of committees um, and you know, Duran's splitting his time today. He's going to another meeting, so he's all over the place, but he came and talked to you today because we, we asked him to. Um, so it is hard to get that student representation, but he, having the student voice in, in as many spaces as we can is so important. And, and I, uh, I, I'm sure you all appreciated the different ways he said we could all reach out and help them. So Susie, you're up next. Hi everybody, welcome. I'm Susie Nitzel and as Carrie said, I'm the professional development coordinator for Fresno City College. So you'll be getting, the, many of you have worked for Fresno City College before, so you know the amount of mail alls we get from the campus. Uh, I also send mail alls, mine are the one you want to pay attention to, because if you get an email from me, that means there's training going on that's going to benefit you. Uh, in my other job at Fresno City College is classified Senate president. Um, I am a former, I'm an alumna of Fresno City College and like Duran, I was a student and uh, I say it, I say it often enough that I hope it doesn't become trite, but uh, even though I look as a white woman, I look like I have privilege and I do because of the color of my skin, uh, my background was not, uh, I, came, I came to Fresno City College via a very rocky and tumbled road. And I say that Fresno City College didn't just change my life, it saved my life. And that's due in part, in very large part to the faculty and the classified professionals and the administrators along the way. So um, it never ever escapes me that the job that I am doing, that the job that we are all doing is changing lives, is saving lives. Uh, sometimes you get so caught up in the humdrum or the endless Zoom meetings in the time of COVID, uh, but that really we are making a difference. My best friend is a nurse at Valley Children's Hospital. And he and I have this kind of fake argument. We go back and forth. He goes, I'm saving lives. I'm like, I'm changing lives. Both are equally important. So what we do matters. Um, and that's really just about it. Uh, for me, I'm gonna let this move on. 
Awesome, Susie. And I want to say, um, so now the some of the planning team is, is hearing this for the third time. I worked here for six years before I was friends with a classified uh, personnel per, or classified person. Um, and that's just wrong. So one of the things that we're hoping you get out of today is that we're all working together. You know, so students are at the center. That's our goal. We are all trying to serve our students and we can't do that on our silos, you know, so the, we depend so much on um, the classified staff for the support that they give us and the administrators. I um, mean, it's important that we're um, connecting. Thank you, Susie, for um, sharing with us today. And for the Academic Senate, I'm just going to hand it over to you all and let you guys introduce each other. Okay, I will. I'm first on the agenda, so I'll start. I am Marianne Valentino. I teach psychology. That's as Carla Kirk likes to say her real job. My real job is to teach psychology. And I also serve as the Academic Senate past president. And it says on the screen that I am also the current IFL lead facilitator. Um, the president of the Academic Senate, that position requires a six year commitment to the executive board, theoretically. So two years as the president elect and two years as the president and two years as the past president. I started my president position seven months early because the president took a dean position at another college. And um, I am now starting my fifth year as the past president. <laughs> that doesn't sound right, but that's right. <laughs> um, and that was just due to a, a series of unfortunate events. Um, although I am very fortunate to be part of the current um, executive team under the leadership of Carla Kirk. Um, during my presidency, the ch statewide chancellor's office said to the colleges, you all need to get those equity plans that are collecting dust on a shelf someplace and you need to take them off the shelf and you need to breathe new life into them. And they gave us this ridiculously short time frame in which to do that, which is not unlike the statewide chancellor's office to give us this big thing to do and not enough time to do it. And um, I, I'm not I'm not trying to use that as an excuse for what I'm going to say next. I um, under my leadership as the academic Senate president, I threw together a task force to draft the um, new student equity plan. And that little task force was all white. And I didn't see that. I didn't, I didn't see it. And it, it took, uh, I'm very grateful that uh, a couple of colleagues came to me privately and we had a uh, difficult and private conversations to help me see that. And I am grateful that the state chancellor's office decided to grant us more time. And they granted us more time and we expanded the task force to include um, more diversity, specifically racial diversity on that task force. Um, and we wrote a flawed plan, we did, uh, in that it was still too short of a time frame, and we, we we wrote a flawed plan, understanding that it was a living document. And I believe it was actually in that plan that we said, we need to pay for a faculty coordinator of student equity and success. And uh, that's how we got Ray Ramirez. And that was his position at the time was um, faculty coordinator of student equity and success. He is now the director that position has changed and he applied for that job and he got that job and we're all grateful for that. Under Ray's leadership, we um, entered into a two year contract with Q, the Center for Urban Education. So you can hear a lot about Q, it's the Center for Urban Education, which is out of the USC School of Education. So we entered into this two year um, contract with Q and Ray asked me to 
serve on the advisory board for Q, which was a two-year commitment. As part of that discussion, Q developed a series of uh, equity labs, change labs, they called them, and I participated in the change lab. Uh, Carrie did as well, and Carla. Um, I only can see a few people on the screen. I think um, Julio was part of that as well. That's it, if I if I'm not saying your name, Jackie. I apologize. Ja I don't see Jackie on the screen, so yeah, Jackie. Uh, you know, because I can't see everybody. So there's a few people in the room who were part of that uh, series of change labs. As part of the change labs, the idea was that we would model a homegrown version of those change labs that uh, Q came up with the name of Interdisciplinary Faculty Equity Lab, but that's really long to say. So we are now just calling that IFL. So when you hear IFL, that's what that is. Um, I still have my psychology peeps when I say IFL, they're like, what's IFL? And I'm like, really? Uh, so IFL is the Interdisciplinary Faculty, Faculty Equity Lab. And it was during a graduation ceremony. I don't think Ray's here yet. It was during a graduation ceremony in our casting gowns. I happened to be sitting next to Ray Ramirez at the graduation ceremony. And he, he leaned over and he, in his Ray way, um, Ray is quite a, kind of quietly and humbly assertive. And so in his Ray way, he said, um, we, we really need someone to facilitate the interdisciplinary faculty equity lab. And I think you'd be really good at that. What, what do you think about that? We're, you know, we're in our caps and our gowns at the, the best day of the year, which is graduation, watching our students walk across that stage and get their diplomas. And um, I said, yeah, I'd be interested in that, not really thinking about what that commitment was. And, and that's how I got to be the um, Interdisciplinary Faculty Equity Lab lead facilitator with the idea that I will hand that off at some point to someone who goes through those labs with, with me. Um, on June 3rd, the State Chancellor's Office had the call to action webinar. And I didn't set a timer, so I hope I'm not going over my time. Um, uh, the call to action webinar. And on June 3rd, I was um, really, my head was in creating this video that I was spending way too much time trying to get done. And so I did that instead with the idea that I would watch the webinar later. And then everyone started talking about it. I heard Carrie talking about it and Carla talking about it. And I got very anxious about watching it. And um, I know I'm getting emotional. And I had to uh, apologize to Carla Kirk. I think I did that in an email that I hadn't watched it yet. And um, the only logical reason that I could come up with was my white fragility, that that was what was getting in the way, which was very hard for me to admit to myself, but it, it was the truth. So I, I watched the call to action webinar a couple of weeks ago. And um, right following it, I watched the anti-blackness webinar put on by Cora, the Center for Organizational uh, Responsibility and Action. I don't know if I have that acronym right. Um, and I, I jotted down these five words after I watched the call to action. And the five words that I have on a sticky note here, and it'll probably sit here for a very long time, the five words that I wrote down were self-reflection, humility, vulnerability, privilege, and courage. Um, so I, I want to welcome you and I welcome you um, on this uh, racial equity journey that we are all taking together. That, that journey starts with you as an individual and your um, courage to confront yourself and your courage to confront others with love and with hope. Welcome. Thank you. 
Oh, and I'll introduce Michael Takeda, who is the <laughs> president-elect, and hopefully that will just be two years, two years, two years for, for Michael Takeda. <laughs> we'll see. And I, you know, I, <clears throat> I, I, I say this all the time, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm so happy that, uh, that I'm serving right now, uh, and that, uh, that my president-electship um, is in such a time that I get to work with both Marianne and Carla and learn from them um, because, uh, you know, it's such a big job uh, and it's such an important uh, role on the campus and I'm learning so much from, from both of them and it, 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 it really speaks a lot to, um, to something that, that Carrie brought up uh, just a bit ago. And, and that is that, uh, that, you know, equity and, you know, all the things we do on campus, it, it really is a campus-wide team effort. Uh, and it's not just, you know, something that we can do in our own individual areas, uh, in our own individual divisions, in our own individual uh, service roles, right? It's something that it's going to take all of us. And, you know, as I'm looking at, at my obviously limited screen, um, I see people from all over campus and in all of the different roles and so many of the different divisions. Um, and it's going to take all of us working together. And so, uh, you know, I'm not going to take up much more time. I know uh, Carla has a lot of important things to say, but, um, you know, but I will say that, that, uh, that I'm, you know, I am learning a lot and, um, and I look forward to, you know, in a year from now, Carla, uh, you know, <laughs> taking over uh, for her and, um, and carrying on uh, this work. Because again, uh, you know, to Mary Ann's point, uh, you know, this equity work uh, is not something that, that's gonna be fixed in a year or two years. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe even 10 years. It's gonna be something that is gonna be ongoing and it's gonna take our continued uh, focus and our continued effort. Um, and we can't, we, you know, we absolutely cannot let this moment pass. Uh, we can't let this focus uh, get by us or, or um, you know, be, be taken over by, by anything else that, that someone might come up with that, that may seem more important. Uh, this is uh, what's important. And this is really, you know, in my mind, this is community college. Equity is what the community college is here for. So um, with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to our Academic Senate President, uh, Carla Kirk. Thank you very much. You guys probably don't know this. I'm Michael's biggest fan. Um, you're going to hear so many wonderful things about what Michael is going to be able to do as Academic Senate President starting on May 23rd, 2021. You can have this role. Um, I actually had to jump off the meeting early yesterday, so I don't know how much time I have to talk. I'm going to read the entire Academic Senate handbook to you and then, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I will probably try not to take too much time. I'm going to try and go 10 minutes. I see people laughing. Good. Um, I, I try not to take more than about 10 minutes and I, it's not going to all be about Senate. So to start out, yes, uh, Dr. Valentino, she is when I call her that. Uh, she is uh, right about this commitment to Senate. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll get to her. Let's, I'll, I'll talk a little bit. Oh, no, my real job. Sorry, I have a meeting thing popping up and that meeting's going to have to wait for me. So my real job here at Fresno City College is to teach African American studies. And that is, um, it, you're hard pressed to find someone who had a more um, narrow focused path in what their college education was supposed to do. I went to college just to get this job. And if I was not hired into this role, I was going to go back to making pizza because that's what I knew how to do. Uh, I was singularly focused on becoming an instructor in the African American Studies program because I was a student in the African American Studies program here at Fresno City College. Uh, I came back to Fresno City College as a returning student. <clears throat> I was 28 years old. 
I was a single mom. Uh, I was, I got engaged actually after my second semester here. Uh, I was coming out of um, a tenure career of fast food and um, office assisting and filing jobs that I, I knew that I needed to get a college degree to move up in business administration, which is what my expertise is in. Uh, so my relationship with our classified professionals is one of familiarity because that was my role for so long. And uh, Linda Lyons was one of my very first friends at Fresno City College. She was our division secretary and I bugged her 15 times a day to make sure uh, that, that I knew what I was doing. So I actually started at Fresno City College my first semester, I was a business major. And my plan was to get a degree in business so that I could move into something like human resources. Uh, my second semester, I was in Mr. Sawalsi's class and he said, uh, no, no, sister, that's all wrong for you. What I need you to do is study this and then come back and teach. And I said, Mr. Sawalsi, doesn't that take like six years to get, have to get a master's degree? He said, yes, so hurry up because I'm gonna be retiring soon. Uh, so I went speeding through college. Um, like Duran said, there are so many scholarships. I never stopped to apply for a scholarship. Um, I got married and then we had a baby boom in my family, I had three kids in two years. Don't do it that way. That's, don't pile them all up um, like that. Um, but I was determined to come and the more that I learned about African-American history, the more I learned about history and world history, the more excited I was to come and share that and to be a history teacher and to teach this history in a program that is unique in our district and is not and is unique in our state, which is a full degree program in African American studies. And it's African American studies, that's not a sociology class that's uh, doubling as an ethnic studies class. It's not housed in our humanities division in a, in a kind of cobble together. It's a full degree. Um, and so I'm very proud to be a part of this program. Mr. Swalsey put a lot on me and he still does uh, to carry this program. This program is uh, 48 years old. Uh, that's older than me, barely. Um, to carry this program for this next two, three generations after me. So that is my real job. Um, my role now, thanks to Marianne Valentino, um, you know, it was funny, she said, uh, we have a similar story, uh, how she became the lead of Eiffel, is that um, Marianne caught me in the breezeway one day and said, hey, would you be interested in being the president of the Academic Senate? And I said, Marianne, I don't even know what the Academic Senate is. I don't know where you meet. I know there is a Senate. I heard it's a big scary place where things go to die and people go to get yelled at. Um, I, I don't know that that's, and you know, she caught, I hadn't even put my bag down yet. Um, but she explained to me the need and I had talked to some um, mentors that I have that I yell at now who told me this would be a good idea. Um, it is a six year commitment. It is a big job and I am not gonna bore you with all of the intricacies of the academic Senate because then you will never come and join. So really briefly, what we are, we are the academic Senate represents the totality of the faculty on our campus, our full-time faculty, our part-time faculty, our non-instructional faculty. We represent that collective voice in matters of academic and professional policy making and uh, planning on our campus and within our district. So I don't have them memorized yet. There's 10 of them, plus one more. Uh, so in areas like curriculum, uh, program review, uh, grading policies, our educational development, our degree requirements, our faculty roles and accreditation and planning, um, there's 10. When we get started, I will have a little card. Do I have mine? I have a little card that has all 10 of the areas of academic Senate and you can carry this card. And when you have a question and say, should I take this to Senate? You're supposed to look at the card and say, is it one of these 10 
things or could it fit in this plus one? And those are the things that we in Senate advocate for. Just so I'll tell you, because I'm on a roll, I am not the boss of the Senate. I am not the ruler of the Senate. I am the public voice of the Senate. That is my role. And so when I speak publicly on behalf of the Senate, it is because the Senate has compelled me to say things. So I think maybe that was one of the misconceptions that the, this is a place where somebody gets in and they're just kind of the boss of what happens in Senate. That is not what Senate is. That's not what Senate is designed to be. And so my role in Senate and our equity efforts are tied together because I do lead a program that uniquely serves the majority of our African-American students on our campus. The things that we were looking at in equity are the things that our program over the last 48 years has been designed to address when we're talking about the educational needs of our African-American students and our students of color and all of our students and having a really concise understanding of our American history. Carly, you froze. Are you still there? I'm going to type in here. That looks frozen. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you're good. You're not frozen anymore. So an analogy that I like to use in class is, and you are all old enough, so maybe you've all seen it, is this movie called Poltergeist. Um, this is I don't think everybody's movie. old enough. <laughs> It's an old movie, it's from 1982. It's an old movie, a horror movie, about when suburban housing, um, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and call them housing projects. Suburban housing projects were a new kind of thing. And they built this big fancy housing on top of a graveyard. And what they did is they only moved the gravestones and they left everyone buried underneath and then built on top of them. And so then their housing project was haunted because they didn't move the bodies. That is what racism has been in the United States. We removed the signs of racism, the, the whites only. We moved all that stuff. We removed this need for affirmative action, told ourselves we're colorblind, but we never dealt with the underlying structures of racism. And that's why they keep popping up like the bodies at the end of Poltergeist, popping right out of the pool, coming out of the closet and biting people's heads off. And so our inability to look at the underlying issues that's kind of what we do. We're trying to, in African American studies, we try to give folks the context so they understand that these things are not new. They just come up uh, with different names. The way that I got work or started in the equity work on our campus is we did have a faculty coordinator and that faculty coordinator was Ray Ramirez, who was also a part-time instructor in our Chicano Latino studies program. Uh, so I share an office with the lead of the Chicano Latino Studies program, Dr. Matt Espinoza Watson. And I remember Ray coming into our shared space saying, this work is so hard. I feel like I'm doing it all by myself. It was, it was like his safe space to come and say, I just want help. And I promised Ray that I would be there. Listen, you don't have to do this by yourself. I will come, tell me what you need me to do. Put me on whatever committee you need to put me on and we'll get this done if we have to carry this on our backs ourselves. And I hope that I have stood true to that statement for Ray. Um, I did as much work as I could on the equity committee. I was involved in writing our new, very progressive, excellent student equity plan that we are currently working on. And when I saw the opportunity to come into a role on our campus that was more of a leadership role, and Ray said, they want you to be Senate president? Yes, yes, you gotta do that. Thanks, Ray. Um, because we knew that if our Senate was supportive of our equity efforts, that that is saying that our faculty is supporting this effort. And so what, I had promised to do was make sure that this would be a priority for our Senate. That is the one thing that I can do is to make sure that as we look on how we are serving our students that we keep our racial equity practices 
at the center of how we are planning. I had one more thing to say, and then my computer just turned off. It must not have been important. One little flick of my screen can throw me entirely off. Um, so we have carried these equity, um, equity efforts forward. Uh, we are doing excellent work. It was important for us to come and let you all know from the start, as you're joining our RAM family, um, that this is the focus, this is our area. We will be bold. Oh, I know what I was gonna talk, the call to action, finally. I was gonna close it with the call to action. Um, I'm gonna not get emotional and, tell, and so not share about uh, how I was feeling at that time and uh, how significant that call to action was for me at that day and at that time. Um, but what I heard from that was a call to folks on campus who occupy these spaces of power to be bold in what we do. And so uh, during our, one of our open forums that our Dr. Goldsmith holds for us, I did make some bold proclamations about how our Senate will be moving forward. And I do that um, unapologetically. Uh, this is my last year before my very, very good friend, Michael Takeda takes over the leadership of the Academic Senate. I am so excited for his commitment to continue this work. I am gonna be happy to step into this role called past president so that Marianne Valentino cannot be past president um, anymore. I will be changing my name after I'm past president. I'll disappear and like Kaiser Sose and you'll never see me again. Good luck with that. I am gonna give it my best shot. So I think that's plenty of talking for me. I'm really easy to get a hold of. Uh, I'm not going to bug you about Senate stuff your first year, but you are on my list to come for in the future. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Carla. Um, I, I love your poltergeist analogy. <laughs> that was great. And listening to all of you talk makes me miss, I was on the Senate Executive Committee for many, many years, and I'm not. Um, the past two years, and I just loved it. I've served on Senate, uh, and so since Carla's not going to plug it, I will. I have served on Senate minus one year since I started in 2006, and uh, as, as most of you will, or some of you will know, this is not an exaggeration. I've served on probably 50 committees and subcommittees and task force in my time here. Senate has been um, the the most grounding and the the one that reminds me who I am as a faculty member uh, so I think it's a really good one to be on if you are a faculty member, and I'm, I'm sure that's true of the classified Senate as well. Um, so I'm, I get to introduce Ray, but you all heard some really good things from um, Marianne and Carla and Michael. So I'm just going to say a couple things before Ray uh, does his piece on, he's going to talk to us a little bit more about equity. So you've been hearing this word quite a bit, and he's going to delve in a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to say a couple things. Uh, my own personal journey, and I, I, I would guess at least half the people that are on our task force or our, our planning committee would say the same thing, um, really began with Ray um, and uh, becoming friends with Ray and working with Ray over the last couple of years, two and a half years, I think now, um, uh, changed my mind and my way of thinking. Um, so I, 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 can, I, I, was, I thought about equality. Um, that was, I thought I was equality minded. I was not equity minded. Um, and so coming to understand that is really about, for, and what all of us are trying to do, this is a culture change. So we are changing the culture of our campus. Um, Ray and I, we, we've co, we co-chaired the, we co the um, Guided Pathways work group. And so we're always trying to come up with taglines. So what is the relationship between Guided Pathways and equity? Um, but one of the most recent things, um, so we talk about uh, equity, um, uh, equity is the destination, Guided Pathways is the vehicle. Um, but more recently, we've been talking about, you know, to throw the word equity out there, um, it's really about equity mindedness. Our goal is to close equity gaps. That's the goal. Um, but equity mindedness is the way we get there. So we can't close those gaps unless we change the culture. So that's why we're all here and that's why we want you to be here today. Um, so Ray, as uh, Marianne mentioned, is our Director of Student Equity and Success and he is going to uh, share with you some details about 
some of the trainings that we have, what's going on on campus, and just a little bit about what equity is. So Ray, I'm going to hand it over to you to get your slide going. I should uh, have your slide up. Thank, thank <laughs> and, you very much, Carrie. Um, Carla, uh, Marianne, Carrie, um, I, I really don't know what to say except no one has really ever hyped me up to the level that you all just did. And it's really hard to even um, present after um, those very kind and thoughtful comments. I very much appreciate you sharing a sentiment with the group. Um, the feeling is very much mutual. Um, and I hope that our new colleagues and friends that are joining us in the new employee um, equity orientation um, will we'll join us in this journey um, as we embark on our, um, our equity journey. And, and really that's kind of um, what it's been about. Um, Thank you, Susie. I forgot to say next slide. <laughs> um, you Don't know, be me. I'm, I'm advancing the slides for you, FYI. Thank you, Carrie. Um, someone who has been very near and dear to both my scholarship and practice and, and work at the college is um, Estella Ben Simone. Dr. Ben Simone is the director uh, of the Center for Urban Education at the USC um, uh, School of Education, um, the center that Marianne uh, just referenced not too long ago. And I, I thought it would be very fitting and suitable to start this presentation um, with a, a very pertinent quote uh, that Ben Simone often says in her presentations. And that is um, really this equity that we're talking about, educational equity, um, it, it's a journey and not necessarily a destination. Often in, in complex organizations such as Fresno City College or community colleges in general, you know, we, we, we uncover, discover these issues and problems and we want a treatment or a program or some type of provision or solution to address that issue, right? Unfortunately, what we learned through not only research, but just practice in general is that addressing um, equity gaps is, it's, it's not linear, it's multifaceted, it's multidimensional, and therefore it requires a multi-pronged approach to addressing um, long-standing equity gaps and moreover um, racial equity gaps and so um, I want you to think about this presentation um, from the perspective of a journey and understanding that um, I'm inviting you to um, embrace the information that I'm sharing and then we can um, go from there. So next slide please. Um, do we have time for a, a quick poll? I, I, I want to be mindful of time and apparently we do. So here's a quick poll. This is just to kind of um, have everyone engage with the presentation so I'm not speaking the whole time. And we also kind of want to have a, a general idea of where new colleagues and friends stand uh, with regard to some of these questions. So take a few seconds to uh, complete the poll. Susie, I'm not able to click. Are other people able to click on it? So if you're a co-host, you cannot click on it. Oh, we don't get to participate, got it. <laughs> I thought I was clicking on this thing and <laughs> I'm getting everyone's vote. Looks like about nine out of 24 folks. Um, well, about a half minute or so. Closing in five, four, three, two, one. Great. Can we display the results? Do I need to share for that, Susie? No, it should be up there. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see the results? I can. Okay, great. So um, we did this just to get a general idea of where, where um, new friends and colleagues stand with regard to some of these questions. Um, so it looks like um, most uh, respondents are either um, moderately familiar or extremely familiar with um, equity minor practices. Um, in a similar way, well, somewhat similar, it looks like um, most respondents are moderately familiar or somewhat familiar, moderately familiar um, with um, racial equity practices. And what we're gonna kind of talk about later is those are really synonymous in many ways. Um, lastly, how uncomfortable are you talking about race in the classroom or workplace? Um, and it looks like approximately 75% of respondents uh, indicated uh, they are slightly uncomfortable um, or not at all uncomfortable. So that's actually a great start. Wonderful. So um, 
the reason why we did this is just to get a general pulse of where folks are and then also kind of share some of the work that we're doing to address some of these questions that that we posed. Next slide, please. Great. So before I share some of the work that we're doing um, regarding our equity efforts at the college, um, we thought it would be really suitable to start with a couple terms that guide our work. Um, it's really important when we talk about um, educational equity and really anything in, in education that has to do with the entire college, it's important to start with um, a common understanding with phrases. So next slide. Great. So this is actually, I'll go ahead and let you read this because you're all fully capable of reading this. <laughs> and I don't like to regurgitate words all the time from the slides. Um, but what I do want you to know is that this is an official college definition of equity. Um, and while it's not exactly where I would like it to be, I would like to see it perhaps improved or enhanced. Um, we are one of the few colleges who have actually defined student equity. And this um, a few years ago for many college was a, an extremely huge problem because not defining equity in a, in a common way makes it hard to talk about and uh, discuss in an understandable way across constituency groups. So we're very fortunate that a group of uh, leaders from faculty, uh, Senate and classified Senate and a couple of administrators got together and we came up with this, I, this uh, definition. What I wanna emphasize is um, the statement about um, historically marginalized students. That's really what we focus on with our equity efforts here at the college, right? Next slide. So with that definition in the backdrop, I, I wanna talk about equity mindedness. Um, many um, of my colleagues have talked about equity mindedness and equity mindedness was first, this phrase was first coined by Dr. Ben Simone in 1999 in one of her seminal works and pieces. And a couple years later after that, she co-authored another paper where this phrase and term was, was further um, elaborated and so it's very um, definitive and it, it, it's defined in a concrete way. And so specifically equity mindedness refers to um, individuals or educational practitioners who are race conscious in a positive manner, right? In, in, a, in a positive affirming manner, um, as opposed to being colorblind or race evading. Um, and it also requires um, individuals to be institutionally focused, systemically aware and equity advancing um, and one might be thinking, wow, how can I be race conscious? Like I need to see everyone the same. The reality is that that is disadvantageous to the mission of uh, community colleges, right? Just like the community college system has evolved since its inception, for example, here in California and Fresno, uh, the college evolved to environment um, after World War I, as it did in World War II. Um, and, you know, fast forward um, several decades later, what we see in part is that the community college as a system has not responded to the racial ethnic boom in demographic changes and associated needs and, and really cultural norms and values of their students. So this is um, why this equity mindedness is profound to the work we do at the college. Next slide. So in the spirit of time, I'm going to share uh, approximately four more slides that, that further unpack the two definitions that I just shared. Um, you know, I think Carrie talked about how when we first started working together and we first met, she had this equality mindset. Though I would argue and say, Carrie, even though you articulated your thoughts in, 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 in an equality mindset manner, I know you've always cared about equity. You just didn't have the... Um, the language capital and dispositions of equity minded notions, right? And so Carrie developed that almost immediately um, just because she had that, that authentic care for equity and racial equity specifically. But essentially um, equality imagines a world um, that is equal, right? Um, so one might say I care about all students equally, right? Well, unfortunately we know, next slide, Certainly uh, it is not equal, right? Certainly no educational institution is, uh, is equal, um, which is in part related to poorly funded schools, less skilled teachers, counselor ratios, truncated curriculum. And what you see depicted uh, uh, here by the Center for Urban Education's um, uh, images, you know, you have these ladders and these students that are climbing up the ladder and that's analogous to different racial ethnic groups that are trying to reach their educational goal and what we see on the far left is this could be a representation of minoritized and minor marginalized student groups who are trying to achieve the same goal. However, there is a litany of barriers, um, most of which are barriers that we have agency over 
that inhibit their ability to reach their educational goal. Next slide. So adding to that to complicate things more, we know that you know part of the human phenomena um, uh, includes us all having bias, right? One of my dear mentors, Dr. J. Luke Wood, always says that being biased is not bad. Doing nothing about being biased is what's bad, right? And so when you couple you know bias and systemic racism and forms of those into the previous uh, displayed slide, it further complicates the student experience and inhibits their ability to reach the educational goal. Um, and understand that as I'm showing these slides, this is part of our journey, our equity journey at the college where we kind of started in about 2015. I see Dr. Cooper shaking her head yes, she's been uh, an ally the entire way, as has Cindy Loon I see is on the, the call here and, and Keith Ford has also been extremely supportive. Um, and it's, it's evolved. So next slide, kind of see the journey a little more. So within that same framework, right, or picture, um, one might say, well, then we need to increase or heighten our focus on diversity. Um, unfortunately, what we see is that diversity lens focuses only on bringing more students into an unequal pathway, right? So therefore, the question is, if we increase, you know, the enrollment or more diverse students, how is that ad addressing things structurally or how is that addressing things in a practical, pragmatic way? It really doesn't, right? Next slide. So in contrast, um, you know, this is where I would say um, we are, um, where we are headed as a college in our equity journey. You know, equity redirects resources to the pathways with the greatest need to fix barriers and intentionally provide support. Um, and Marianne and Carla and everyone that spoke before me, it's like you it really, it just speaks to our, our, our authentic and collaborative efforts and how, how frequently we work together and have worked together over the past years because Everything my colleagues said before I came on here, it just speaks to this uh, ladder and these bubbles of text, almost as if we coordinated it. I promise we did not coordinate it in that way at all. It's just happened that way naturally. But, you know, with that Q partnership that Marianne talked about, we started with a, a series of reports to um, inform inquiry and to understanding the state of equity at the college. And since then, we have intensely focused on training for faculty, staff, and admin to establish goals and use our positions of power, whether you're a faculty, a classified professional or an administrator to advocate for equity and also to use whatever agency you have to influence um, equity and outcomes. Next slide. So in a nutshell, this is a, a, a display. Um, it's not exhaustive by no means, but this is just a, uh, a uh, summative um, uh, display of our equity journey at the college. As Marianne alluded to earlier, in 2015, um, the college was charged to expeditiously come up with an equity plan. And just so you know, there actually has been a student equity policy in the state since 1998. However, it wasn't until approximately 2014 when um, the legislature appropriated funds to the chancellor's office and then the colleges to actually develop um, implementable plans with financial resources. So. If you see along the, the timeline here, essentially what we, we, we've gone through, and I want to kind of just summarize this, right? And again, I can't generalize this to everything across the college, but in a nutshell, this is where we come from. In our previous equity planning efforts, and therefore as a college, we primarily focused on addressing equity gaps and racial equity gaps with programs, right? And um, groups of people nested within a division, nested within a department, or perhaps a program that is in a department, right? Um, since then, what we have done is said, those are great. Let's learn from some of those practices and let's see how we can perhaps cast a wider net and we can do something that is more institution-wide and college-wide. And more specifically, what could we do to enhance the ability of faculty, classified professionals and administrators to really lead and teach for equity and advocate for equity um, we believe that that's a far more sustainable effort to close equity gaps um, than uh, relying primarily on programs and a few services here and there. So here we are, 2020, 2022. Um, this uh, corresponds with our three-year equity plan, 2019 to 2022. Every college is required to maintain a three-year student equity plan. And uh, this plan in part can be summarized as promoting and actualizing principles of equity mindedness and social justice as the drivers to transform lives through education. 
transforming lives through education is part of our, our um, vision statement. Um, and we've coupled that with our equity efforts. And that's uh, a, good, um, a, a good picture of where we're currently at. Next slide. And then Carrie, how are we doing on time? So we're running a little bit behind, but if you, can you do maybe can you, five minutes, 10 minutes? How much time do you need? Five, we, we can make it work in five. I can do that. Awesome. So um, we're going to provide these slides, I believe, to everyone so you can read through these slides in, um, in your own time, or you can reach out to me if you want to learn more about the equity policy and efforts. So in a nutshell, this is the policy that informs our equity planning efforts. And I have this up for two reasons, to inform you about the policy, yes, obviously. But more importantly, although there is a legislative mandate to maintain a student equity plan, monitor benchmarks um, so equity goals are achieved, more importantly, this is our moral imperative, right? We're an open access institution. However, access without equity, essentially, I maintain is an unfulfilled promise to the community and students. So uh, we have this policy, we have some resources, but it's really our why and our moral imperative. Next slide. And we're almost done here. So these are a select few activities from our current student equity plan. And I really wanted to share it with you because most of these are activities that you will either be involved with directly in the near future or have the opportunity to be involved with. Um, part of that includes um, bullet point number uh, three, student equity and completion faculty onboarding. This is the official title of the activity that we included in our three-year equity plan. So what we're doing here um, it represents something that we said we were going to do in our equity plan that corresponds with efforts of other groups on college that were looking at doing something very similar, uh, which is the planning committee and group that put this together for all of you. And so this is part of that work. Um, in a similar way, we created another activity that is going to be designed more for um, administrators, um, or as I tell my colleagues and counterparts, those that are in official positions of power and influence. And so the purpose of that um, that Equity Academy for the administration and leaders is to learn about how to use their leadership and agency um, from a position of power in the college to advocate and advance equity. Um, of course, Eiffel, I don't need to belabor Eiffel anymore. Um, Marianne is the, the lead faculty facilitator for that and she talked about that. Um, another activity is a comprehensive transfer level math and English completion plan. This is part of our what is called AB 705. Um, uh, work at the college. Uh, essentially, we are uh, required not to um, use um, standardized testing for placement into math and English, and this is part of that work. And um, what I'll close with, these last two here, CORA and the IDEA Summit. Um, CORA is a three-year contract with the Center for Organizational Responsibility and Advancement. We have four 15-hour online trainings at no cost. If we didn't have this contract, it would cost individuals $200 per training to complete and it's no cost. Um, we have trainings on um, racial microaggressions, teaching men of color, supporting men of color, and unconscious bias. Um, and in the spirit of being in an educational context, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't emphasize that all of these trainings are informed by, by research, informed by scholarship, and also juxtaposed with practice. So um, it's not just a training but to learn about things and learn about concepts and tools, but actually how to apply them. So. It's really cool. It's really um, a, a great uh, resource for everyone here. And lastly, our IDEA Summit, or the Institutional Development for Equity Access and Success. Unfortunately, we had to um, postpone this event that was originally scheduled for May 22nd, 23rd. Um, we had some great speakers on the books. One of them I will mention is Professor Ibram Kendi. Um, Professor Kendi, um, as of late, has garnered the attention of many people across various sectors and walks of life you can think of. Uh, we had him on the books or in the contract for about three months before the summit and we're trying to work on actually getting him back out to do a virtual event in the near future. Um, so lots of good opportunities um, for everyone to enhance your, um, whatever your level of understanding is um, about equity mindedness and to enhance your understanding so you can apply um, those concepts of equity mindedness to whatever it is that you will be doing with, here, with us here at the college. Next slide. Um, there's a Black Minds Matter public course, um, and we will be sharing more information about this um, free public uh, course um, hosted by um, Drs. J. Luke Wood and Frank Harris. It will include um, a, 
a lot of other scholars and practitioners from the higher education field. Um, Susie Nitzel and the Professional Development Office will be sharing communication with the campus so you can learn more about that. Um, this is um, an addition to um, two Black Minds Matter series that we previously held in 2017 and 2018. So this is a continuation of that work. Next and last slide. Now I know I essentially um, asked you all to drink water from a, wa a fire hose. <laughs> and I do apologize, um, though I hope that you found some of the information that um, I shared and my colleagues before me meaningful, informative, and hopefully um, perhaps uh, give you a sense of urgency to learn more about how you can get involved with equity. And so I'm gonna close out with this final quote. Um, it, it really uh, closes the initial quote from Estella Ben Simone. And that is the equity journey begins with you. Change must happen individually before it can happen collectively. I'm a big believer um, of this sentiment in this statement. And with that, I wanna uh, leave you all with this. And I think we have to go on to the next section. Thank you so much, Ray. And uh, Ray it shaved his presentation down because we were running late. And I'm sorry for that, Ray. It was, but you can all go back through. We're going to send you the slides. You can have them. And um, as we've mentioned, everybody is here to answer questions for you. And, and Ray's door is always open. So he will, he will definitely engage with you more. And you will, you will certainly hear from him more in the future. So um, before we take a little break, uh, I wanted to show you the next year at a glance and our plans for the uh, Equity Academy. And then we'll do the break and then you guys will go into your cohorts. So this will be the it for the whole group and you guys will go into the cohorts after the break. Um, so this summer we have today the, uh, the new Faculty Equity Academy. We started today. Uh, as I mentioned in the email, we are paying you and we will have more information coming on that. Donna Cooper has been working diligently to make sure that is all coming together. Um, and how that's going to work. It's hard for those of you who are new faculty who don't currently work with us. Um, it's, it's complicated with how we do, you know, how we do pay. So that, that's coming together. You will get paid um, and, and we're working on getting it as soon as possible. Um, the 13th, July 13th, if you want to take a screenshot of this, that's a good idea. I also emailed it out to you in, in the e email invite. Um, Marianne, who you met today, is going to be leading an equity-minded syllabus redesign. Design. Uh, some of you are not redesigning, you're maybe doing this for the first time. And if you're classified or administrators, you are welcome to attend. Um, or if you're non-instructional faculty, a lot of you are non-instructional faculty, we're inviting all of you. All of us are going to attend as well, if we can, those of us that are available. Um, and Marianne said, so we're making her nervous by bringing all these people in. But uh, it's a good idea for all of us to see what we think about in, in terms of what it means to be equity minded in the classroom and it really begins with the syllabus. Um, and then after that, those of you who are faculty will have a follow up with your support guides in um, workshopping some um, equity minded syllabi that you've worked on yourself. So if you've already made a syllabi, then trying to incorporate some of the ideas. Uh, so this is just a support time for you. And then um, there'll be a three-day orientation August 3rd through the 5th, where those are before duty days. And there'll be three hours each, 9 to 12. Um, and again, we're encouraging everyone to attend um, and you will be paid. Uh, and this is, uh, this, this is, we'll really get into some nuts and bolts about starting the semester. So a lot of you probably have questions about, uh, you know, things that, that we're trying, what we're trying to do throughout the year is provide support when you need it. So I'll just tell you one little tiny thing in previous orientations, um, they're talking about how to submit grades and, and we're thinking nobody cares in August about how to submit their grades, right? So <laughs> we're trying to help you get the semester started. You know, what do the first two weeks look like? And then we're going to have some support throughout the semester. Um, and in terms of the trainings that Ray is going to provide, uh, the equity trainings, we're suggesting a maximum of five hours a week with a minimum of 15 hours total for the semester. So I'll explain that just a tiny bit and then your support guides can answer more questions about this. Um, so we have five hours a week in our contract that's specifically for 
um, uh, Keith, I'm going to get this wrong. It's not not just professional development, but it supports to, uh, to, uh, to Keith, help me out here. The five hours, what are those technically in the contract? Are you talking about the flex days or the mentorship? No, the five hours in addition to, so our required work week when we have five oh. hours a week. Yeah, five hours of uh, commitment to the college. Commitment to the college, thank you. Okay, that's what I was looking for. And um, so we're uh, saying if, uh, if, you, if you have no idea what you need to be doing and you want something to do, then you can spend that five hours on equity trainings. We have plenty for you. However, if you are serving on other committees, we definitely don't want you to overcommit yourself. So do a minimum of an hour a week, uh, but, but don't st stress yourself out. And, and the support guides will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then you'll be getting in with a co you'll do a cohort check in once a month, maximum two hours. And those are small groups. So you'll be in groups of for this is for faculty, you'll be in groups of four, four, five ish. And um, you will talk about what you learned in your trainings, what takeaways you had, questions you have, things like that. So that's our plan. And then that'll be through the, the spring as well. And then the spring trainings. Uh, so the fall trainings will focus more on um, uh, equity, the things that Ray was talking about, Cora and um, uh, uh, some of the webinars and things like that. Um, the webinars that we posted, those kinds of things would be great for that training. Um, and then focus more on pedagogy in the spring, pedagogy and equity. So before we take a break, any questions? Because um, you will not see the rest of us, just your, your support guides. So any questions for the planning team before we take a break here? And then when you come back from the break, Susie, I, I, help me out here. Um, we'll go take a break and when they come back, they'll just log right into their break rooms, right? Breakouts? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I would suggest just mute yourself and turn off your video and step away. And then when you come back, uh, I'll put you guys into your break rooms. Perfect. Instead of leaving the meeting and rejoining. Okay, so any questions before we end? This part. What, what time, time should we, we be back? back? Yeah. Oh, so let's do a five minute break. Um, let's say 10 after 11, so eight minute break. And then that, that shaves the support guides a little off by 10 minutes, is, I hope that's okay. So you guys have 50 minutes. Sounds good. Welcome right. to the Ram family, everyone. I was glad to see before you all jump off. See what I did, Academic Senate President. I'm just going to start. <laughs> I wanted to tell you all before you jumped off the screen. Welcome to our family. We're so excited to have you all here, joining us. This is uh, this is the best job in the world. So I'll see you guys in a little bit. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> Jackie just sent me a private chat. I'm, I'm talking quietly to myself and I'm not muted. So now you all have a peek into my how my brain works. It was a private chat, Susie. No one could see it but you. You outed yourself. It's okay. I'm an open book. I'm totally an open book. I'm not above making fun of myself. Okay, so it's 11.10, and I'm not sure if everybody's back yet or not, so I'll give it one more minute before I stick you into breakout rooms. Now, Carla and uh, Carrie, of course, and Shushanik, any of my co-hosts on here, except for Donna, uh, will not be going to a breakout room, so then I guess you guys are free to go after. Um, convocation for the faculty support guides talking about convocation and flex. Um, convocation has not been determined yet. The president and the exec team are working on it. Uh, I was in a meeting with them last week. Uh, they're going to, we always try to do a bridge between convocation and flex and we're trying to do the same thing. I can tell you flex will not be the normal technology trainings. It will be more about discussions and panelists and discussing pretty much what we went through from March and all through the summer. 
and what we've learned and how we need to go forward. Uh, so it's going to be less technical than past. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about our, our lineup. We've got a lot of community members coming in because the professional development committee decided since Flex is faculty, uh, for the most part, you know, peer to peer learning, we figured faculty had enough to do, so we were going to bring in some outside resources. Also, again, tie into that equity for our most uh, disproportionately impacted student populations. So I've got um, uh, we've got Bitwise coming in. I've got um, Cami is working with some of the Hmong support uh, groups, uh, disabled students, um, formerly incarcerated, foster youth, so stuff like that. So it so should be pretty exciting. Okay, I'm going to stick you guys into your breakout rooms. Thank you all for joining us. If you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to any of us um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Have fun.